team i hope you're doing okay um hopefully all the sound is coming through all good um and you can see that we've got a little bit of human evolution content to be going through today um so just give me a, a thumbs up in the chat if the sound's coming through all good um and what you should be able to see on your screen is a list of terms or like um, little statements now those statements all relate to either biological or cultural evolution um, so what I'd encourage you to do um, is if you're watching this later on is to pause um, the video 
um, and just have a little bit of a think. Can you quickly go biological, cultural, cultural, biological? Can you figure out which one is which? Um, what I'm going to do is move on to that in a second, uh, the answers to this, that is. Um, but first, we're going to just have a little bit of a talk about our uh, final checkpoint for our internal. So I thought I'd go over that first. Um, additionally, our Terotaki Itewiki. Uh, is covering these concepts relating to cultural evolution. Um, so we talked a little bit about cultural and biological evolution before, but we're just going to have a recap of that. We're going to talk about some of the different tool cultures. Then lastly, we're going to talk about fire, art, and spirituality. Um, and that will pretty much uh, wrap us up for human evolution. We'll have a little bit more content next week, uh, which will partially be a bit of a review of Out of Africa. Um, but uh, that should be good. Um, and then that'll bring us to the end of the term. Uh, your tasks for this week are primarily just to take notes from these slides as well as to continue um, to finish off your transgenesis and selective breeding internal. So that should be your primary focus, um, but this content will help you to, to review that stuff. Um, so, on to the internal. Um, the final checkpoint, which is due um, on the last day of term, uh, relates to the merit and excellence criteria. So if you've done those things from the previous checkpoints, you've already hit the achieve level, which is good. Um, but what you can see here is some stuff in orange and some stuff in green. The stuff in orange is the merit level uh, and the stuff that is green is the excellence level. Essentially, all you have to do beyond referencing your initial report, making sure all your key ideas have points and making sure that you've met those checkpoints from one through four, is to um, um, explain selective breeding with, so not just um, describe, but like explain it, uh, and then talk about why a technique was used or how a technique is done. Um, so technically speaking, for the merit level, you just need to explain at a sufficient level either one of those things, the, the how or the why. Um, and it's the same for transgenesis. So you need a how or a why at an explanation level of depth um, for both selective breeding and for transgenesis. Um, in addition, you need to explain your biological implications. So um, talk about those clear links uh, between the technique you're describing and what will happen as a result biologically, um, given uh, what, is it, what technique it is you've been talking about. Uh, for excellence, it's a full discussion, so that's about level of depth, um, clarity of that sequence of ideas, linking your um, bio, linking your your technique, be it transgenesis or selective breeding or both, um, right the way through to the final biological outcomes that you will see. Um, the last excellence level criteria is to have um, a chunk of content where you compare and contrast those biological implications, um, and there's a bunch of terms there that you could be using or thinking about, um, but it's essentially just comparing uh, those two uh, ideas together and looking at how they're the same and how they're different. Um, yeah, just a note there, all of your writing needs to be linked to your organism. And put a different way, this is our marking scheme. So this is when I'm going through your reports, this is what I'm going to be looking at. Um, in order to judge if you've met those criteria. Um, so I tried to phrase them on that previous slide so that they were clearer. Um, if you have any questions, just leave a comment on your document. I'm about halfway through um, giving um, your feedback, um, so I'm going to get the rest of that done today. Um, so just leave me a comment if you want me to have another look at your document. Okay, without further ado, let's go on to biological and cultural evolution. And you'll notice each of those statements um, relates pretty clearly um, to either one of these ideas. It's actually uh, all pulled up directly from this table from SciPad on page uh, 293. Um, what you'll recall is that biological evolution is a slow process where traits are passed down from generation to generation using genetic material, DNA. Um, you can't choose what genes you've got, at least not at present, um, uh, with the technology that we currently have, and it's a slow process that occurs uh, over generations. Cultural evolution, by contrast, uh, is transmission of ideas, not genetic material. Um, it can be passed between any organisms that can communicate. So 
You don't just have to be genetically related. Um, this can occur rapidly across a well-connected uh, population, um, and they can those traits, those ideas, uh, can be learned at any time. Um, so they can be trans transferred from organism to organism at any point in their lifetime. Um, and organisms can choose to accept or reject any of those traits. So there are key differences here uh, from cultural evolution just to uh, biological evolution. So hopefully um, you're familiar with those ideas. All right. Um, now we need to cover a few little topics within biological and cultural evolution. Um, now we've touched on many of these before, so I'm hoping that they won't be too much of a, a stressor for us. But we need to talk just briefly about the technical detail around the evolution of the hand. So we talked about how, as a result of selective breeding, um, selective breeding, sorry, as a result of the selective pressures that were put on us um, or put on our ancestors. Um, that allowed us to stand upright, we suddenly had free use of our hands. Um, with that free use of hands, Homo sapiens uh, and other hominid species uh, that occurred before us uh, developed uh, less curvature in the fingers because they no longer needed to brachiate, which means to swing through the trees, um, and they developed rather long thumbs. The reason being, it gives you the ability uh, to make fine motor controlled movements, um, to finely grasp an object, to manipulate things. If any of you can do the pen flicky trick, which I can't do, um, that would be an example of that. Um, it allows you to also build more sophisticated tools, which, um, and we'll talk about the consequences of that at a later stage. Um, so, the biological, the reason why we talk about the biological uh, evolution of the hand is because it's essential for understanding a lot of the cultural evolution, which a large number of these ideas relied on um, having like fine ability to find control and manipulate objects. Um, so the ability to make tools was greatly influenced by the ability of us to be able to make tools at a more sophisticated level. Um, the ability to make fire was again re reliant on fine motor control, um, clothing, art, everything else. Um, all pretty much relied on these traits gained uh, through uh, the controlled use of our phalanges, which is pretty cool. The other thing that um, is important for us to think about is that a lot of our cultural evolution is pretty rapid um, over, over the whole thing when you compare it to biological evolution. So um, about two and a half million years ago is when we start seeing the oldest tools, which were called older one, which we'll be talking about in a moment. Um, but you can see how rapidly um, we start getting uh, big progressions in cultural evolution. I'm looking particularly at the last 10,000 years, which is about where our topic uh, comes to a close. And the, um, the, the sociology and history sort of starts to take over. Um, so hopefully you can see from this timeline that... Um, as we develop more sophisticated technologies, the rate of cultural evolution uh, occurred, uh, or the rate of cultural diversity and, and uh, those changes pressured through cultural evolution happened more and more rapidly. Now, within this, we've got tool use. Tool use is one part of this. Um, and essentially what you've got is older tools and you've got younger tools. We break them up into four different categories, which we'll talk to you about later on. Um, but essentially, the older tools were less sophisticated. Um, and as they uh, uh, were iterated on over time, you eventually had this new new tool technology, which uh, increased uh, the length of those cutting edges, uh, made those tools more precise, uh, increased the number of blows it took to make a tool. Now, there's a cost to that, isn't there? So it takes more time to make an individual tool, but that tool's utility can be increased. Um, so it relies on uh, the organisms in question uh, to treat those tools with care um, and to use those delicate tools delicately. Um, so you can kind of see that gradual progression over time, and we'll, we'll get to, to that as we go through this topic today. All right. Um, there are a variety of different pieces of information which tell us that cultural evolution um, relates to more uh, than just tools, but we have found examples of those tools in the fossil record. Um, and we found differences between different tools used by uh, different species throughout our history. And um, we've also found different uh, burial methods, different uses or places of fire, um, and uh, 
the evidence of bones of large animals um, in nearby locations to where uh, our, our ancestors would have lived. Um, and the nature of those bones, of these fires, of these burial methods and those tools tells us about the cultures of the organisms that use them. Um, so we're going we're to break that down a little bit more. Um, so we also have evidence um, looking at our, our ancestors uh, of the size and shape of their skulls and the size of the brains that would have fit within inside those skulls. Um, larger more folded brains uh, with particular uh, prominences in certain regions tell us that um, over time uh, our ancestors developed a greater ability for speech, language, tool making, um, social cohesion, all of that sort of thing. Um, and the reduction in those jaw and skull features where you have large muscle attachments that facilitate uh, big chewing um, indicates that our food uh, changed over time too, that it became more cooked, and so we needed to expend less energy chewing, and so we could put that energy somewhere else. And that energy primarily uh, went to our brains, uh, increasing uh, our, our intelligence and therefore creating this positive feedback loop. Uh, because if we were more intelligent, surely we could get more food, and that creates this, this feedback loop that eventually led to the organisms we are today. Um, so that's kind of what the slide is talking about here. Um, so this is kind of a stepwise process. Um, we would call this a positive feedback loop because it feeds back into itself. Now, hopefully you remember from last year learning about positive and negative feedback loops. Um, negative feedback loops suppress themselves to equilibrium, whereas positive feedback loops create a continual process. Um, and so the development of our brains and facilitation with uh, uh, the development of the rest of ourselves, be it our hands or our our, our skull features as well, um, created this cyclical um, uh, the cyclical uh, effect. So, given that, um, if you were to come across a question like this, um, there. Uh, which is in the slides uh, for you this week, you could probably think about how you might answer these sorts of questions. Now, we've actually given you uh, the answers here um, in the following slides, but if you want to, you're welcome to take a bit of a pause and see if you've got um, enough of an understanding so far to be able to have a go at this. Um, if not, you can watch the rest of this video and then kind of come back and have another look at this. Um, but this is the type of question we'll be doing some more practice on next week. Um, so yeah, alright, let's have a look at the answers to this one. So, in terms of impacts of fire and tool use, um, by cooking food you kill parasites, greater chances of survival. Um, if you heat meat, it means you can gain more energy from it, um, decreases the energy needed to expend chewing or digesting in general. Um, so that creates less of a selection for those large jaws, big teeth, um, all the muscles of the face and, and that are involved in chewing. You no longer need to put energy into building those, um, which then means you can pump it into uh, energy into other places, such as brain development. Um, greater ability to retain nutrients, um, again, leads to that. Um, same effects come from if you're more intelligent, you're better able to hunt, and so therefore are likely or more likely to get uh, high levels of food. Um, the development of sort of um, tools, uh, some of the sophisticated tools we'll be talking about today, mean that you could uh, break open, uh, say, large bones and access bone marrow, which is very uh, nutrient rich. Um, but essentially, what tools allow you to do is to get uh, more. Uh, for the same kill or for the same harvest. Um, lastly, one you might not have thought about is the idea of uh, campfires provide uh, light at night. So that provides you more time to sit around and communicate. And so there's this idea that these fireside chats facilitated uh, the development of Brokers and Wernicas, those areas associated with uh, language uh, recognition and processing and speech production. Um, and that uh, the kind of sophisticated levels of communication that we have come about in part because the control of fire allowed us to have these fire side conversations, which is pretty neat. Um, but essentially, you've got that positive feedback coming in there. 
And as long as you're talking about the sequence of steps, then um, you're on the right track for answering this question. Um, so that kind of talks about these links here. Um, so fire and tools, quality of diet, da da da, da um, increasing nutrition, bigger brain, you get the idea. So with a larger brain, more complex tools, better ability to regulate those tools, um, better probabilities of cess during hunting or exploiting whatever resources you have in the natural environment, and then that in turn leads to a bigger brain. If you want to watch um, a video with some more information, there's a great uh, one here from Chris Kazard. Um, but lastly, that brings us basically to the end of our first lesson, looking at these ideas um, around cultural and biological evolution, having this sort of interplay between one another. Um, so it's kind of, we, we teach it a little bit initially, it's kind of like this, this uh, biological evolution led to cultural evolution. In reality, they feed into each other um, with regards to our ancestors over the past two and a half million years. So um, that's kind of an important idea to wrap your head around. All right, on to lesson two. So um, if you want, you can have a pause of the video and have a look at uh, trying to explain the differences between biological and cultural evolution. I'll reveal the answers in a moment. But in this lesson, we're going to look at tool use. Um, we're going to look at our main classifications of tools. And we're not going to talk about upper Paleolithic tools, which are uh, the most modern, basically pre-Bronze uh, uh, Age tools. Um, we're going to talk about the, the three uh, older classes, older one, Archulian and Mysterian. Um, so we're going to move into that now. Here's the answer to the Mahia. So biological evolution, transfer of genetic information. It's a slow process, relies on uh, passing of genes and through gametes, all of that sort of thing. Um, cultural evolution, by contrast, is fast. Its transmission involves communication, uh, can involve any number of different ideas, um, but uh, individuals can choose to select them or not. Um, you get the idea. All right. We have another um, video here, if you want to watch it, uh, from Khan Academy, talking about um, the idea of cultural evolution. This is quite a different style of video, but it's a useful one if the frameworks that we've been presenting to you so far aren't helping it to click for you just yet. Okay. So, during uh, human evolution, uh, we had uh, different types of tools being used at different points in time. And you saw that on the timeline that we looked at in the previous, uh, not episode, what is it? Listen, there we go. Um, now, we divide uh, these tools into kind of somewhat artificial um, divisions, uh, but they are a useful way uh, for us to break down the types of tools that we used and who used them. Um, so you might hear any of these terms used, um, any of those ones in bold, and each of those tool periods and tool cultures are associated with different species. So you might hear the terms lower, middle, and upper Paleolithic, um, and you will also definitely hear the terms older one, Archulian, Mysterian. Um, sometimes we like to teach it as older one, Archulian, Mysterian, Upper Paleolithic, um, in terms of the, the levels of tool cultures. And each of those tool cultures will be associated with different species. Um, so you have older one uh, primarily associated with um, uh, Homo habilis, uh, the handyman, um, Archulian associated with Homo erectus, uh, Mysterian associated with Homo uh, neanderthalensis, and Upper Paleolithic tools associated with uh, our great ancestors, the Homo sapiens, um, who then developed uh, these other uh, tools which led into the tools that we have today, such as the smartphone or laptop you're watching this on. So we're going to talk through each of those three uh, oldest tool periods um, and talk about how to identify those tools so that you can identify them for yourself. Um, and then talk about what they meant for the organisms that use them. So, um, these are some examples of older one tools. Um, older one tools are pretty old. They're about somewhere in the region of 2.5, 2.6 million years old. Um, now, we think that they were used by Homo habilis. Homo habilis, um, well, the habilis part means, kind of, its, its nickname is the handyman. Um, and that's because uh, they were the first... Uh, organisms to build tools that they carried around with them. Um, we would call these tools uh, uh, 
essentially you had like a core and you flaked off chunks of that core. And we'll show you some different examples of these. Um, now, these were used basically for about two million years, you know, a long time. Um, uh, and so here's some different examples of these kinds of tools. The classic ones are chopper, discoid, and polyhedron. Um, but we'll show you some in a moment. Um, and then this evolved into uh, the Archulean tools, which were more sophisticated than older ones. You can remember this because older one starts with old. It is therefore the oldest. Um, so here's another breakdown of that. Um, and here are some examples here. So this one um, is a chopper. Um, choppers were made by uh, flaking off essentially the top half of a stone. Um, and what you could do is you could smash this chopper uh, down onto um, some bones or whatever it may be, and that would allow you to extract bone marrow, which is incredibly nutrient rich. Um, you could also use it uh, in hunting. Um, you could use it to extract meat. Um, it was a pretty versatile tool, but it was quite a useful one. Um, considering prior to this, um, you'd just be using your hands, right? There were no, there were no big tools available. Maybe you had sticks, um, but these were much more durable. Um, other examples of tools you might have seen at that time are hand axes. Um, so this is probably a more sophisticated hand axe, but that's okay. Um, hand axes were flaked on both sides, so they weren't just um, as it's a rock uh, cut, largely carved off. They were um, designed to have two distinct sides to them, and they were used for butchery, um, they were used for digging, they were used for chopping down trees and things, um, they were used for uh, hunting in a variety of different ways. Um, they could also be used, and they were used in later stages, to make those flakes, which could then be used as tools. We'll come to that when we talk about Archulean tools. Um, discoids were also used. Um, they were flakes. All sides uh, were removed. They were shaped like a disc. Um, again, used for similar purposes. Um, so you could have a go, if you happen to have a rock at home, uh, at making a chopper or a hand axe. Uh, probably I would recommend doing it in a safe way. Maybe ask your parents for permission as to which rocks you should use. The second thing you will find if you do want to have a go at this is that some tools are much easier uh, to make than others depending on what rocks you have available. Um, and so the, the uh, Homo habilis would have had to learn which rocks uh, they were able to make these tools out of and which ones they weren't. Otherwise, they'd be spending a lot of time building something that was kind of worthless, and so they'd be wasting energy they could have spent on hunting. So, next part, Archulean tools. Um, this was made by some students a few years ago, um, so I'm going to use their, their slides shamelessly um, because they're really good. So, uh, thank you uh, to Moy, Luca, Matthew, and Stephen. So, about 1.7 million years ago, uh, Homo erectus uh, first uh, found that the use of of um, certain uh, types of materials, particularly flint and obsidian, because they're really hard. Um, if they got their rock and hit it against another rock, they would be able to make a hand axe, right? Um, now, the Acheulean hand axe um, is a little bit more distinct. So probably the, I'm thinking the one that we saw in the photo um, that we showed before was actually an Acheulean hand axe. Um, Acheulean hand axes were um, hand size. They were a little bit smaller um, than our older one tools. They um, had carved edges as opposed to um, uh, non-carved edges. Um, they tended to be teardrop shaped for ergonomics, so it was easier to hold. Um, and you could use them for basically all the same stuff that uh, the older one tools were used for. Um, you could use them to scrape meat, um, and that would give you a greater return on each hunting trip. Um, you could also use them to cut uh, trees, um, and you could use them, uh, which would be then useful for uh, making and controlling fire or burning an existing fire. Um, so it would be quite useful in that sense. Um, you could also use them to skin hides, which would allow you to wrap yourself up in a hide and stay reasonably warm, um, or even to put things in the hide to then carry it from place to place, because as you will remember, all of these hominin species were to some degree nomadic. Um, so they traveled across uh, the spaces that they were inhabiting. All right, 
Our last big tool period we're going to talk about is Mousterian. Um, so the Mousterian is in uh, the middle of the Paleolithic era. Uh, the Mousterian tools uh, are a little bit more distinct. They're primarily used by Neanderthalensis. Neanderthalensis, as you will recall, um, have the largest cranial volume, so the largest brains of any of our hominin ancestors. Um, the stone was much more meticulously worked than Archulian uh, and than older one. Um, and they required essentially longer to make. But in return, they were a more efficient tool uh, for all of the tool for all of the tool uses that they had. So here are some examples. So here you can see the hand axes are a little bit more sophisticated than the ones that we've been talking about before, but you also have some new tools. Um, so cleavers, uh, which I think you can understand were used to cleave. Um, uh, blade tools as well, which were designed to be really sharp, um, and you could have a go if you wanted to, at making one of these. Um, again, please be safe. Keep your fingers out of the way if you're going to be smashing rocks together. Um, and these are a wide variety of upper Paleolithic tools. So if we compare these ones, these are our, um, our essentially what our, our Homo sapien ancestors would be making. But if we were to look at these ones, you can sort of compare the level of sophistication of your... Um, of your Mysterian tools, ah, okay, that's fine. Sorry, I got a little bit confused. These are, yeah, so these are our Mysterian tools, but if you were to compare them to our Archulian tools, a little bit less sophisticated, a little bit more sophisticated, you've got use of blades, so essentially the flakes were being used as tools at this stage, um, and so those flakes could be used uh, for, essentially as a kind of a sharp knife, um, in contrast to only using the hand axe, but if you compare the hand axe at Mousterian level to these ones, you can kind of see the jump in quality and sophistication that you've got with a Mousterian tool. They would have taken many more blows to make. When you get to Upper Paleolithic, which we use for Homo sapiens, you can see that they get a, a wider variety. Um, the carving is much more intricate. These would have taken significantly longer to make. I mean, look at those needle tools over there. Um, those tools, by the way, are needles. They were designed for um, uh, essentially uh, making of sewing uh, hides together, um, which is really cool because that's kind of the, the advent of, of modern technology, which is pretty neat. Um, so uh, upper Paleolithic tools, they were used by Homo sapiens. There is some evidence that they were also used by Neanderthalensis, but primarily Neanderthalensis used Mousterian tools. Um, uh, they were much more refined. You had a way large variety of tools. Um, so we showed some needles there before, but you also had ropes, nets, snares, um, um, all sorts of other things. Um, yeah, uh, essentially it allowed uh, for a wider variety of uses for these sorts of things. Um, we have some more information in here on how blade tools were made. Um, uh, and you're welcome to spend some time reviewing these. This is like kind of a little bit of additional detail um, around upper Paleolithic tools. Um, but some of our first tools use these sort of wider variety uh, of techniques. By the way, pressure flaking um, uh, is a technique that uh, people have used. Just be very careful if you ever want to have a go at doing that, that you don't then jab it straight into your, your fingers. Um, but you can also see that there's some other sophisticated mechanisms for making uh, these, these types of tools here too but they clearly are going to be much sharper, um, but also take a lot longer to make than some of those ones from the older one or uh, Archulian eras. Um, yeah, a nice way of thinking about it is um, that when you get up each tool level, it's about how many tools you're using to make that tool. Um, so particularly when you're at upper Paleolithic level, you have to use a whole bunch of tools to make your tools. Whereas for older one, it's you hitting your rock against another rock. Um, the more complex tools require you to essentially have uh, sophisticated tools already in place in order for you to be able to make the tools you want. Now, why are we teaching you about this? Okay. Um, the key thing to link it back to is the idea of biological and cultural evolution, right? Um, the longer that we uh, uh, were able um, to survive or the longer that an organism was able to get energy, um, the better off they would be. And that allowed for um, uh, a greater ability for them to pass on their genes, 
um, more of their energy to be put into uh, the brain, you get this positive feedback loop, uh, which we've talked about already. Okay. Oh, um, by the way, this is like a, a way that some people like to remember it. Out of Africa model um, means you go O A M. That's a way of remembering it. Um, if you can come up with a silly one, that's good. Um, just remembering that order uh, is important. Now, our last lesson for today is going to be talking about fire. This one will start a little bit differently. Um, so uh, we'll give you a pause. Um, you can have a bit of a think. Maybe you can think immediately off the top of your head of a couple of benefits of fire use. Um, but I'll show you those here now. You're welcome to pause the video if you don't want those to be revealed straight away. Here you go. Um, oh yeah. So in this in sorry in this particular slide, um, uh, we have like a video that kind of relates to these ideas um, and answers essentially those questions about uses of fire. Um, but hopefully, if you watch this video, you'll be able to get it. But essentially, uses of fire. Um, there's quite a few of them. I'm going to um, flip down to them now. Um, so you have a larger, wider variety of foods that you can eat. It's a whole bunch of foods you couldn't previously eat. You can now cook and now eat. Um, you're warmer, so you're able to survive in colder conditions, which is really useful. If you're going through an ice age, hint, hint, that is exactly um, what happened um, at around, I think, 100,000 years ago. So um, that might be something that comes up in your uh, research. It allows you to longer the, uh, lengthen the amount of time in the day. Um, increases your social interactions. You can make better tools because you can put them in the fire and um, make them harder and stronger. Um, but essentially, your job would be to understand each of these and be able to explain them. So if somebody asked you, um, why is fire being used? Um, you could say, well, here's the benefits that it provides organisms. So um, given that, I recommend watching this video. Um, the answers to the questions that are there are in the... Um, the speaker notes, um, so you can have a review of those there. The video is only a couple of minutes long, but it's a useful introduction to these ideas of um, the use of fire. Um, what we do know is that fire was uh, has been, we've seen its use um, about one, like 1 1.4, 1.5 million years ago, um, but controlled use of fire didn't happen for over a million years. Um, so essentially, we were able to control fire from lightning, um, but the idea of being able to make uh, flints that meant you could make fire whenever you wanted it, uh, we don't see evidence for that until around 350,000 years ago. So essentially, you had a million years of sporadic fire use when nature allowed you or allowed the organisms to collect that fire. Um, so we have evidence that hearths would have been kept for long periods of time um, and repeatedly kindled and kindled and kindled um, so that you could continue to have these fires because tools did not exist for a very long time uh, to create that fire whenever it was desired. Um, so given that, um, our last little challenge for you is a thing called the carrot test. Um, so uh, as we're moving into level three, perhaps you could uh, ask your whanau or um, whatever you, it may be uh, in your situation uh, to get yourself a bag of carrots. Um, now what you can do is you can divide these carrots into two groups, um, a group you're going to cook and a group that you're going to leave uncooked. Um, and your test for yourself is to cook one set of carrots, leave the other set uncooked, and then to see how many you can eat uh, in the space of, say, one minute. Um, and you could have a go at this with some of your mates. The reason why we're getting you to do this is because we want you to record your observations and have a bit of a think, which is faster to chew and digest, which requires more energy expenditure to chew. Um, hopefully you can see that when you do this, uh, by cooking food, uh, you have a greater efficiency of digestion. Um, it is easier for you to... Um, to eat the calories that you need, um, it takes less energy to, um, you expend less energy eating it, um, yeah, and therefore you can spend more time uh, learning, doing whatever it is you want to be doing, as well as uh, investing in uh, having a large brain, all of that sort of thing. Um, there's some other information there for you there, uh, but essentially, 
uh, that is the end. That is the reason why, the biggest reason why um, fire was so important uh, to our species. So, uh, given that, we've got a little bit of SIPAD information, which I'll leave you there. Our last topic for today, uh, which will take us about four or five minutes to go through, is art and spirituality. So, um, we have evidence that Homo sapiens, as well as pro possibly Homo neanderthalensis, um, were producing, to some degree, pieces of art. Um, uh, and this is really interesting because it tells us something about the, um, the organisms uh, that were able to think creatively. Um, so some examples of pieces of art are that of the Cro-Magnons who lived in uh, particular regions in France, um, primarily in caves, um, and uh, they had these quite sophisticated drawings uh, of horses, which were found uh, in these uh, caves, which you can spend some time uh, looking at if you'd like to. Um, those of you who've seen, uh, I think it's Brother Bear, they talk about this, um, but also the, uh, the evidence for this, um, uh, for art, uh, is that um, you see sort of a variety of different paintings around the place that are um, quite old. Um, so these ones are, are from uh, Chauvet Cave um, in um, that particular region. Adeche? Hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway, the key point here is that you've got a wide variety of different forms of art that were created uh, in the Upper Paleolithic era. Um, and those pieces of art uh, eventually turned into symbols that you might, to some extent, recognise. Um, the question is why? Like, what changed? What allowed us to start producing art? Um, and what does that mean about the types of thinking that these organisms were doing before they were able to produce art and after? Um, so about 100,000 years ago, we've got paintings like these, um, done by, uh, uh, well, up to uh, 100,000 years ago. Um, the oldest ones we've we've seen evidence for so far, I think, are in the region of 30, 32,000. Um, so, uh, yeah, we don't exactly know um, if there are any older ones out there. Maybe you could be the first to discover them. Um, but what we do know is these species... Uh, these organisms that produce these, there was something that changed that gave them the time uh, to be able to produce uh, paintings like these. Um, and that might tell us about the nature of those organisms, that they were able to think um, in ways that were uh, more sophisticated uh, than their predecessors. Uh, maybe they had enough spare time to dedicate to art. Maybe they were able to think creatively. Um, and so there's a few other um, videos here, which you can look at around particularly cave paintings um, uh, around the place. There's also um, some great stuff here in the Smithsonian uh, website on manufacturing of art. But the last thing uh, to talk about is spirituality. Um, so around 34,000 years ago, we have our first uh, evidence of ritual burial. Um, so what is modern day Russia? Uh, there were uh, a group of organisms who were uh, uh, buried uh, with a large variety of ivory ornaments. Um, so those ivory ornaments would have taken a huge amount of time to make. So we talked about manufacturing stone tools, right? Just how much time it takes to bang one rock into another rock. But it takes a huge amount of time uh, to make these ivory beads. And yet these organisms were buried with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, so what that might tell you is that the the people who buried uh, these people uh, thought that the burial with those ivory beads uh, would be beneficial to those organisms in some way. Perhaps it indicates the concept uh, that these organisms had uh, of the afterlife and that these pieces would have some sort of value there. Um, so it's sort of demonstrates almost the, the origins of religion itself and the idea of um, spirituality. Um, so if you want to look at some more information on that, there's a link there for you. 
Um, but that basically brings us uh, to the end of our lesson today. Um, your two jobs for this week are to work through uh, the final checkpoints uh, on transgenesis and selective breeding, that internal, um, and just to review this as best you can. We'll have some more work uh, next week, uh, making sure that we're ready for our senior exams when we go back. Uh, but otherwise, have a very lovely rest of your week, and I will see you uh, later on for our Google Meet. And feel free to bring any questions you may have. All right. Kakite, matewa.